Advent is a time of joyful expectation. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what exactly are we expecting? This is an important question to reflect on, because sometimes we might be expecting something that our Lord is not prepared to give. What do we expect from God? The prophecy of the first reading tells us that many people will come to the mountain to be taught. And there's a joyful expectation about this, that finally, after time has spent in exile, this preparation of the people of Israel for the Messiah, finally, finally we will receive the fullness of revelation. But there's a bitter pill placed in the middle of it, if you were listening closely. Scripture says, All nations shall stream toward it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us climb the mountain of of the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, that we may walk in his paths. And then it says, He shall judge between the nations and impose terms on many peoples. What are these terms? Our Lord is putting forward to us what it is we ought to expect. And first and foremost, the thing that we ought not to expect is that in this coming of the Messiah this coming that we once again in this Advent season prepare ourselves for, it is not a coming that ushers in a realm of worldly freedom, of earthly comforts. Rather, it's an expectation of being taught This means that we must have within ourselves, each of us, and I know this goes against the grain very much for Oregonians, we must have a disposition of docility. We must be willing to be taught, to be instructed, and quite frankly, to be told what to do. If that isn't the opposite of the pioneer spirit, I don't know what is. But as Christians, we're not interested in being pioneers. There's only one pioneer in our faith, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, we are pilgrims. We are pilgrims seeking something. And what is it that we're seeking? What is it that we hope to find? And I would suggest to you that thing that we hope to find is the face of the child Jesus. Advent is a time of hope. It's a time of penance. It's a time of preparation. But it's first and foremost a time of hope. That virtue which is so difficult to describe, but yet so necessary for our time. And in what do we hope? It is that we will be instructed rightly and that we will be given the means necessary to live out that instruction. After all, we have been instructed. We have been given the fullness of revelation. This is what our Lord came to do. When he came in the flesh, he said, I came to reveal the Father. 
He revealed the Beatitudes to us. He revealed in his very life the way that we are to live as Christians. And he handed on to the apostles and they to their disciples this deposit of faith, this manner of believing and this manner of living given to us directly from the Lord. God himself, taking flesh, instructs us from the mountain. And indeed, there are terms. And if we don't fulfill those terms, our Lord tells us in today's gospel precisely we, what we can expect. That just like those wicked men, we will be swept away in the flood. And our Lord is not very optimistic about this, if you take his meaning. There's two people side by side in each account, and one of them's gone, and the other one remains. Two people, side by side, doing the same work. But one has lived their life, done their work, as Christians. Focusing intently on following the Lord, seeking after his face. Trying to instantiate in their own lives those instructions that we have received from the revelation of our Lord. And the other, not so much. So what do we expect from the Lord? I would challenge you to reflect on this. What are the expectations that you have placed on our Lord? And has he agreed to those expectations? After all, he has given us and continues to give us sufficient grace to live the Christian life well, to cast off the works of darkness, as St. Paul says in the Romans. To cast them off. To cease living a life of drunkenness and fornication. We have been given the strength to do it. But have we cooperated in that? Or have we sought our own designs, our own comforts, our own wants, our own needs, like selfish children? Or we, do we gaze on the face of our Lord, studying his will, Submitting to his decrees, conforming our life to his, so that we can be counted among those who will be with him for all eternity. To some degree, it's our choice. God has done and continues to do his part. We must choose to participate. And we can be made whole. We can be made free. We can. It is possible to live the Christian life. It is possible to become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It is possible. God's grace makes it possible. On our own, not at all. But as we hear elsewhere, the hopefulness of the gospel, the hope is the promises of Christ. And what has he promised to us? He has promised his fidelity to begin to perfect us now in this life so that we can be perfected in the next. 
But so often we fall asleep. So often we fall asleep in the faith. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter the reason. But we forget. And then we have to wake up. We follow dreams and illusions when we follow a life of sin. It's a life of darkness. It's like the night. It's like a terror dream. And we live bound and chained in a realm of shadow and darkness. But God's grace and the hope of this season proclaims to us that through God's grace we can cast off the darkness, we can cast off the shadows, that we can wake up from the nightmare of sin into a life of holiness, of sanctity, of fidelity, of commitment to our Lord and His commandments. So that we can live as true free men, children of the gospel, co-heirs to the kingdom. We need simply seek His face.